We know that you wanted to be at the Fight Laugh Feast Conference, but you can't come all the days. We have a day pass where you can come on Saturday where you get to hear great speakers like Pastor Doug Wilson, Pastor Jared Longshore, Pastor Toby Sumter, Cross Politics Live Show with Jason Whitlock and Megan Basham. Join us for the Sabbath Feast where we get to laugh with comedian John Brannion, all for the low, low price of $99. Sign up for the day pass, flfnetwork.com. Looking forward to seeing you there at the conference. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to consider the world that we're in in the light of your word. I pray you give us clean, uh, clear minds as we do so. We commit it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I came all the way from Idaho to Middle Tennessee because I have something I want to tell you. As you've no doubt noticed, my topic is Gay Pulpits, with a subtitle that runs The Politics of Feminism, Homosexuality, and Unfaithful Children. Inspired by this, we might want to extend it and turn it into a title worthy of someone who aspires to be a true heir of the Puritans. How about The Politics of Feminism, Homosexuality, and Unfaithful Children, along with anything else that might be wrong with our nation, or even mildly irritating? Yeah. We'll see. Is that too loud? No. Yeah, yes, no. All right. I want to begin with a quotation from Melville's Moby Dick. This is a good example of how 19th century infidels often knew more about what was actually going on than we Christians, than we believers in the 21st century do. Melville says this, the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first decried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is the god of breezes, fair or foul, is first invoked for favorable, favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship with its passage out. The world's a ship on its passage out and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. The pulpit is what steers, drives, shapes the nation. The pulpit is its prow. The pulpit is this earth's foremost part. So I want to talk about gay pulpits, and I want to begin by giving you a stipulated definition of gay. In referring to gay pulpits, I'm not going to be talking about lecterns that are guilty of unnatural sex practices. We sometimes focus on the fruit of perversion or the end of the road of perversion, which is where homosexual practices would be located, instead of looking to the root of all our modern perversion, which would be egalitarianism. And the thing that every form of egalitarianism has in common is its dedication to fruitlessness its dedication to fruitlessness. So for my purposes here today, gay means fruitless. And as believing Christians, we take our stand against gay economics, which hates the fruit of wealth, in wor of wealth for work. We take our stand against gay education, which hates the honors for real study. We take our stand against gay heterosexuality, which scrapes wounds bare of the children who are seeking refuge there. We take our stand against gay gays and gay lesbians and, for, and forever fruitless. This is, my, this is my stipulated definition. Gay gays, gay lesbians who want a strict guarantee that their orgasms will be always and forever fruitless. Gay means fruitlessness. Gay means fruitlessness. A moment ago, I said that socialism was fruitless economics. For this I might be chided by Christians on the left. Was it not the rich young ruler? Was not the rich young ruler told to give away all that he had and follow Christ? Indeed he was. Luke 18, 21. You know the story. He was told to give it all away. And he went away sad. Some cases of gangrene are radical and require nothing less than amputation. 
If you've got a radical disease, you have to amputate the whole limb. To this, our collectivist friends might chortle at my attempts to blunt the sharp edges of this hard saying of Jesus. Twas ever thus, they sigh. How could you possibly think there could be any exception to this severe rule laid down by the Lord Jesus? Well, because of what Jesus said about this same topic just a handful of verses later in Luke 19.9. Jesus said that salvation came to the house of of Zacchaeus and he only gave away half his stuff. Today, salvation has come to this house. Sounds like the rich young ruler got a raw deal. Or maybe he was a bad negotiator. Or maybe the Lord Jesus was addressing the heart of the issue and the rich young ruler had to be willing for amputation. The rich young ruler, he was a ruler, he was a senator, he was a civil official, a higher, uh, probably higher up than Zacchaeus was. But Jesus said salvation came to Zacchaeus' house, he gave half away, and the rich young ruler was told to give all of it away. We clearly see we don't have a cookie cutter approach to this sort of thing. So socialism is fruitless, feminism is fruitless, gay men are fruitless, and so on. God wants lush gardens, and the devil wants a moonscape. God wants lush gardens, and the devil wants a cratered moonscape. The war on fruit is relentless, and as the abortion statistics should reveal to us, it is most definitely a shooting war. This is a very bloody war, and in some respects, it has been the bloodiest of wars. We live in a generation that has declared war on fruitfulness. They don't like fruit. They don't like fruit in any, in any of its forms. And they want to be God, which means they want to be able to uh, create ex nihilo. They, they want to tax every producer into oblivion and yet somehow still have stuff. And then they're astonished when there is no stuff. You need at least three years of graduate school to buy that. We live in a generation that has declared war on fruitfulness. Not only so, but despite the onslaught, and it has been an onslaught, an unremitting onslaught, the Christian church has rarely returned fire. This is a deficiency that perhaps we can do something to rectify. We must do something to rectify it, and soon. In Jude 12, 12th verse of Jude, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead. And then in Ephesians 5, 11, it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. One of the central characteristics of unbelief is its fruitlessness. And consequently, since they have to still get on, they have to still uh, make their way in the world, they have to be parasitic with those who are fruitful. What they have to do is they have to take nourishment, resources, money from people who are fruitful and use it to attack fruitfulness. We have to resist this impulse in every in every human uh, in every area of human endeavor and this mentality of egalitarianism that that hates fruit shows up in virtually every area and these are some of the things that I want to address tonight I want to begin by talking about unfaithful children unfaithful children in the covenant Why did God make the man and the woman one? Why did God want us to come together in a sexual union? What was he after? What was the point? The prophet Malachi tells us. Malachi 2.15 says this, And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That's the question. Why one? Why did God make them one? That he might seek a godly seed, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously 
against the wife of his youth. Now, here, there's something interesting here. He, God wants us to have godly seed, but he then tells the, the men of Israel not to deal treacherously with their wives. But why doesn't he say, I want godly seed, so don't deal treacherously with your seed as you're bringing them up in the covenant? Well, the root of the matter is the best thing you can do for your children, parents, the best thing you can do for your children is to love one another. The best thing you can do for your children is give them a solid, committed relationship that obeys what the Word says, husbands loving their wives, wives respecting their husbands, and when kids grow up in that environment, they thrive. So husbands, do you want godly seed? Do not betray the wife of your youth. Do not deal treacherously with her. If this is the point of godly marriage, and it is certainly one of the central reasons for it, then those who have the rule in the church ought to be setting an example of how to bring up godly seed. In Hebrews 13, 7 and Hebrews 13, 17, we're told that the rulers of the church need to be setting an example for the whole congregation. They need to set an example. And that example has to... It has to include things like how to be married and how to bring up kids. The point is not just to beget and birth warm bodies, but rather to bring up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. We want children to be brought up in Christ. We want children to be brought up in the Lord. We want children to be nurtured and admonished and corrected and welcomed and warmly welcomed from day one, from the beginning. Bring them up. And you pastors, show them how it's done. Show the people how it's done. Model how it's done. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, speaking of qualifications for elders, it says, one that ruleth well his own, his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now this is a strong argument, and it tells you that the church is not to be modeled after a modern American corporation. It's a a family, it's a household of God. And, And a man who understands how to bring up children in a godly household is equipped, is equipped to do the same thing in the church. But you can easily, you can easily imagine how a man could be a lousy dad and a hard-driving CEO, right? You can imagine how a man could be a lousy dad and a great general or a great admiral. But if the family is a family, if the family of God is more like a family than it is like these other things, then qualification in one area, Paul says, is a qualification in the other. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house... How shall he take care of the church of God? If you are equipped in one area, Paul's saying, you'll be equipped in the other. The the soft skills that men need to learn, right? Men need to get married so they can begin to acquire soft skills, which none of them have on their own. None of them have a peak in developing soft skills, people skills, probably when they're 22. And if they don't get married, it goes downhill after that. My father's fond of saying men become old maids before women do. Men need, men need to have a woman and children around so that they can exercise godly leadership in ways that mortify the things that they might want to do if left to their own devices. So a man learns, a man learns in the crucible of the home how to love how to love when it's difficult, how to love when it's easy, how to provide, how to protect, how to do all the things that a shepherd needs to do. Why is it that preacher's kids and missionary kids, PKs and MKs respectively, have such an enduring reputation for being stinkers? Why why is that? Sometimes I think it's because the kids feel like they've got something to prove. Everybody says, oh, you're a holy Joe, so they've got to fight every kid in the school to prove that they're not what they're being taunted for, but other times it's because they hear the name Jesus and all they can think of is the back of dad's head going off to some other thing. So, 
This is also one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we've had such an etiolated response to the homo jihad. It is hard to fight their insertion of disqualified men and women into the pulpit when we have been defending our disqualified men being there for decades. How many times have we defended disqualified men from, from legitimate questions? It sort of takes away the prophetic thunder, if you know what I mean. And the same, the same logic, the same principle, applies to the progressive demand that we start ordaining women. We must ordain women, they say, placing them in the pulpit. I'm going to pay more attention to this in the next section, but I want to say one thing about it now. They demand that we start ordaining women, putting them in the pulpit. Now, for decades, we have been placing effeminate, girly men in the pulpit, and this is one of the things that has given progressive arguments a lot of force. A lot of, a lot of men have drifted into the ministry because of sweet church ladies pinching their cheeks when they're growing up, telling them him that he was the sweetest boy, and have you considered seminary? He's pious, he's, he's good, he's insufferable to the other boys. Well, you, you should be a pastor. But how can you demand, how can you demand femininity in the pulpit and then argue with the fact that women would do a better job at that than evangelical beta males would do? We, we're doing the reverse, you know, Bruce Jenner cracks me up, right? Bruce, I didn't misspeak, Bruce. Bruce Jenner cracks me up. He declares himself a woman, and within a year, he, I think it's within a year, he won the Woman of the Year contest. Have you ever been at a church camp? Well, I'm, this looks like I'm sidetracking. I'm not sidetracking. If you're a pastor, here's another pro tip for pastors. If you, this is why I think church camps and getaways and retreats were originally started. It's sort of a diagnostic test for where, how everybody's doing spiritually. What you do is just go out there and, and get up a church volleyball game. And then you can tell where everybody is spiritually. <laughs> There's the guy who plays all the positions. You know, all the positions on his side of the net and two of the positions on the other side of the net. So you have, so you have this person who thinks he can do everything. He thinks he can ever do everything. I've got this, he says. I've got this. Oh, I can, anybody can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Look at me, Bruce Jenner says. I've been an Olympi uh, Olympic athlete, and then I turned into a woman, and I'm the woman of the year. <laughs> Better than all you schlubs. What have you been doing? <laughs> the only reason these things, people get away with any of this stuff is everybody's sort of agreed to nod, nod along solemnly like a judge. Well, we do the same thing. What... Uh, if you want a woman, if you want a feminine voice in the pulpit, wouldn't a woman be the best person to ask to do that instead of an, a male knockoff? Right. No. You, if you want a woman in the pulpit, if you want a feminine voice in the pulpit, get a woman to do it. And, the, and when the progressives press us on this, we have a hard time answering because we don't believe, we don't really want a masculine voice in the pulpit. We want... We, we're not quite sure what we want anymore. One of the things that the evangelical church must learn is that tolerated disobedience in the pulpit will only get you more tolerated disobedience in the pulpit. You cannot inch your way out of this. You have to repent. If there's some glaring problem, you have to repent of it. We are now just, just now getting a glimpse of just how far the devil might be willing to run this particular reductio. I'm beginning to suspect that before I, before I go off to heaven, I might live to see the ordination somewhere of a tranny 12-year-old. And there will be people, moderate, middle-of-the-road Christians, evangelicals, who defend it. Who say, well, we, yes, we, we might differ with certain aspects of this. But what we really are against is the harsh tone coming from the people who are condemning it. When the church is in free fall, it doesn't make sense to look wistfully back on the first yard or so when you were still just beneath the plane. Our initial problem began when we first set aside the personal pastoral qualifications set out in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 and replaced them with our own right ideas. 
The liberals didn't do that, friends. The liberals didn't do that. We, we've been messing with the text long before the liberals got to it. We, we've got our own house cleaning to do. We've got our own repenting to do. And, and this is not just an isolated sliver issue either. Um, I have no, I, I have a, a great deal of admiration for the uh, 17th century Puritans. And there's, they were brilliant scholars and it was a scholarship on fire. I have no qualms, no problems with a learned ministry. I think the ministry is supposed to be a learned ministry, which is not the same thing as an academic ministry. It's not the same thing. And the personal pastoral qualifications in, in Titus 1 and Timothy, Tim, 1 Timothy 3 are not the same thing as an MDiv. It's not the same thing as proficiency in Hebrew and Greek. As valuable as proficiency in Hebrew and Greek is, and it really is, you want a learned ministry. But in the first place, you want a man who walks with God. That's what you want. And you want a man who walks with God and does what the Word tells him to do. And that leads to the next point. This is where I'm going to verge. I'll prepare you for... Well, I don't know anything to prepare you for it. Here's, here comes a little Zen Presbyterianism. In order to be feminine, the church must be masculine. In order to be feminine, the church must be masculine. The church is the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ is summoned to be submissive to her Lord in all things. If Christian wives are commanded to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ, then this means that the church must be submissive to Christ and to his teaching and to the teaching of his apostles. Ephesians 5.24 says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. As the church is subjected to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. This means that to be truly feminine, the church must be obedient. The church must submit. The church must do as the church was told. The church must behave the way we were instructed to behave. That's what a feminine, obedient, submissive bride would do. And what is the church told to do? The church is commanded to have masculine leadership. The church is commanded to have masculine leadership. So what does submission look like? What does is, what is femininity look like? Now we have to be careful here because, and there, there's, a, there's a couple of big rabbit holes I'm not going to go down, but I just do want to point out that we are dealing with metaphors and images here. The church is the bride of Christ. That's a corporate image. Half of this feminine image, the bride of Christ, half of the church is male. Half of the church is male, but they together with women make up the corporate feminine identity, and, and Christ, our bridegroom, is our husband. Now, th there's a long story. There's a, I'll just refer you to a book hit it and run away. The, the book is The Church Impotent by Leon Podlas. He blames, he, he asks the question, why in the West, Roman, in Roman Catholicism and Protestantism both, why uh, is a favored taunt of unbelievers the, the fact that the, the church is dominated by women and men just don't like church. Men just check out of church. Uh, Podlas' thesis, he blames it all on Bernard of Clairvaux. Now, this dismays me because I like to blame everything on Rousseau. <laughs> but on this, I think he's got a point. Bernard of Clairvaux was one of the first people to take the corporate devotional language of the church, the corporate language of the church, and individualize it for your private prayer devotions. And it's appropriate for the church to be preparing herself as a bride, preparing herself for her wedding day. That's an appropriate biblical scriptural image. But if you radically individualize it and take it down to the individual level, it's going to be a gross turnoff to about half the people in the church. They're going to be trying to prepare, imagine themselves being a bride preparing for her wedding day, and you're going to have two possible problems. One is the men won't like it at all, and they'll check out. They'll just leave. The second problem is that they will like it. <laughs> and, and then you <laughs> have another problem. So what is the church? The church is commanded 
to have masculine leadership. 1 Timothy 2.12, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Let your, and then 1 Corinthians 14.34, let your women keep silent in the churches, keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, um, not to go down another rabbit hole, I believe that this, the commands to the Corinthian church, if someone says, are you saying this always and everywhere without exception that a mom can't shush her two-year-old uh, who's squirreling around and if, it's be, if it's on the precincts of the church? No, of course, of course, of course not. Shush, shush that boy. G- good. Be- two chapters, er- uh, excuse me, three chapters earlier, <laughs> there's three kinds of people in the world, people who can do math and people who can't. Three chapters earlier, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul lays down requirements for women who pray or prophesy, and he says you need to do so with your head covered to pay respect to your husband while you're doing it. I take that as a corporate uh, part of the instructions to the church, not individually. So there are bounds and limits that you put on this, but the, the thing you can't, because you have to interpret Scripture in the light of Scripture, but you can't wad it up and throw it away because it inconveniences you at the dinner parties you like to go to when don't you go to that church where they do thus and such. So women are to keep silence in the churches. They're not to have any teaching office. They're not to have authority over men. They're not to teach men. All right, so if someone visits your church and after the service asks you why the women don't do anything up front in the service, you don't have any women doing anything except for the sweet lady who plays the piano and you sometimes feel like that's pushing it. <laughs> this feminist tells you, well, she says, the image for the church, the image for the Christian church in scripture is that of a woman. You may agree with that. In fact, you must agree with that. That's the, that's the scriptural image. But then you should hasten to add the church is not an uppity woman. The church is never more feminine than when we are tractable, teachable, dutiful, and submissive. The church is called to be a sweetheart. The church is called to be a sweet wife. And that means that the church is never more feminine than when the worship is led by men, The liturgy is conducted by men, and the one who opens the text of the sermon to read it aloud is a man. That is not an example of the men in that church oppressing the women in that church. That is an example of the entire church doing what the Word says to do. The whole church is being more feminine. The whole church is being more submissive. The church as a whole does this by encouraging, developing, uh, getting men to lead and away with all shifts and devices. A saying is current that in the worship service a woman may do everything an unordained man can do. And this is used to crowbar women at absolutely everything except the sermon proper. But enough about Tim Keller. Our reaction to this ought to be something like, huh, we'd better stop giving unordained men so much of the service. Well, maybe we're going too far in this direction. Now, there is nothing more obvious than that pressure is being applied to the church to to start fudging on this issue. And I believe a fair-minded study of the Scripture comes up with all sorts of things. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, it's very clear in the book of Acts that when Apollos had needed straightening out, the verb is Priscilla and Aquila both. They straightened him out. They were talking in the driveway, and Priscilla helped to straighten out Apollos' theology. There's nothing, nothing wrong with it. Don't be, fa- don't be overly fastidious. Don't, don't make up rules that go beyond what is written. But we have to be honest and blunt and square with what is written, and we have to do it regardless of how upset people get. Why? Because we want to be a dutiful wife. We want the church to model 
for the wives in the church that the men in the church know how to submit. The things that, the things that Christian husbands want their wives to do, be submissive to them, instead of jabbing at the text with the finger saying, here's the verse, what's your problem? That, here's a pro tip, don't do that. It doesn't work, not, not how you're supposed to do it. I had a, a, a wonderful experience one time. This was, I thought, a brilliant insight from a friend uh, I was talking with, a man I met at a conference, and he said he'd gotten into a church that where the elders had gotten into a big authority ego trip, and the, the elders are in charge of everything, and we demand submission, and, and you must submit here, 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 here. We are your rulers. You must submit in everything. And this uh, man that I was talking to told me what he said to them, said to his elders. He said, show me how. Model it for me. I don't, I'm, I'm just a parishioner. I don't know how to do this thing that you're telling me to do. Model it for me so that I can see. Now, husbands, if you are wanting your wife to submit to you, what you want to be is part of a church that is jointly, corporately pursuing submission to the Lord. All right? you, you want your wife to see how submissive to the word you are, how obedient to Christ you are, how respectful you are when you talk about your boss when you come home after work. You're modeling, you're modeling for her what submission looks like, right? You're, do you want, your mouth, you want your wife mouthing off about you to her friends the way you talk about your boss? Do you want that? Well, you say you don't want that, but by your actions you say that you do, right? Do you want your, do you want your kids? See, so this is a, lots of rabbit holes. We think, for example, when a two-year-old is reaching for a vase on the coffee table, we, we believe that we are teaching our child, and, we, and you have a modified freak out, and you lunge for them, yelling at them. You think you're teaching them to value expensive vases. What you're actually teaching is how to freak out. That's what you're teaching. Because they're gonna copy, they're gonna copy what you're doing, right? Husbands, you want to model submissiveness to Christ. You want to be part of a body that is all in, following the word, and modeling submission to Christ. And the wives look at that kind of life, and they say, my submission to that kind of man is not a high risk. I can see, I can see that he is doing, he's not asking anything of me that he's not doing himself in another situation. I can see that. I can smell it. I can taste it. So, what we, want, what we want to do is we want the church to be a godly, submissive bride. We, we do not defend the church as an old boys network. Rather, we are taking a stand defending the essential femininity of the church. We want to be an obedient wife. We object, and not mildly, to the church being made over into a butch lesbian. Not a good look, and that's not what the Apostle John saw descending out of heaven at the end of Revelation. Not only do we want the church to be a fruitful wife, we want the church to be a fruitful wife as an example to all of the sisters here. As an example to all of the sisters here. And I want to tie this into the central theme of what I'm talking about, which is the glory of fruitfulness. A fruitful congregation is glorious. A fruitful congregation is glorious. A fruitful household is glorious. A pastor's household that is fruitful is glorious. Here, let me give you a, this will be an exhortation to all of you sisters. Admonition, exhortation. When you conceive a child, don't ever refer to yourself as fat. You may not. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you may not. It was my father who taught me the beauty of pregnancy. Pregnancy is a glory. Pregnancy is it's just this, this amazing thing. One of the glories of femininity is the glory that, that this is where uh, fruitfulness is incarnated. This is where fruitfulness happens. Never forget, men, women, everybody, never forget 
that women are the kind of people that people come out of. <laughs> Never forget, men, how spooky that is. <laughs> Where did you all come from? How are you here? How did you get here? When a woman walks through the womb, when a, when a woman walks through the room, the men should draw back to the walls in amazement. <laughs> it's one of them. Don't know how. So, three cheers for heteronormativity. I, I believe that we're approaching a catastrophe. If God is kind to us, it will be a catastrophe. But I believe that we are rapidly descending to the point of no return one way or another. I would regard the ground of that catastrophe to be our sexual rebellion against God's created order. Our sexual rebellion includes the abortion carnage, the successful sodomite press for gay marriage, women in pulpits, and in the cockpits of fighter planes. But remember Melville, they were in pulpits before they were in the cockpits. Right? Women were in pulpits preaching before they were in combat. The church led the way in disobedience. The church modeled it. The porn, epi the porn epidemic, the divorce rates, and so on. If it is right for us to question Newt's, Newt Gingrich's reliability based on his inability to keep his marriage vows, as referenced just a few minutes ago, and it is, by the same token, it should be right for us to question America's reliability based on our rampant sexual confusions. We break promises, we sleep around, and we dismember the inconvenient byproducts of our pursuit of sexual pleasure. The penumbrae of the Constitution are conveniently arranged by us to shelter our dirty deeds. At the same time, we have arranged no shelter of any kind for the young Americans who may be constitutionally sacrificed on the altars of our orgasms. This is, I believe, the heart of our disease, the heart of our sickness. Egalitarianism, hedonism, perversion, and every other form of homosexuality. Now, some Christians, I see it already happening, some Christians, when it, when it, it looked like the, uh, our forces were about to collide, some Christians suddenly discovered the libertarian option. Yes, I believe that homosexuality is a sin, but I don't think it should be a crime. I don't believe the, the state should be in the marriage business. I don't think the state should be in the marriage business at all. That's the libertarian temptation saying they're supportive of all voluntary associations and people can call it whatever they want. This is beyond naive. An orgy is a voluntary or association. And sinners want to call it any number of things other than what God calls it, which is an occasion for some brimstone. God calls it, whatever God calls it, we should define as God defines. We should define the way God defines. Because marriage involves property and heirs and dependent children, the civil magistrate will necessarily be involved. The civil magistrate must be involved. For example, Solomon adjudicated the custody fight between the two harlots over the baby. That was a custody fight. This is my baby, no, it's my baby. And the magistrate decided. When two people marry, you have joint... You have, uh, you have uh, property in common, you buy a house together, and then the marriage goes south, now what? Who decides? Marriage in a republic like ours cannot be reduced to something as easy as a boy and girl in second grade deciding to like each other. That can be resolved by the parents having a talk. Whatever the definition of marriage will be, because of the ownership custody issues, that are the necessary ramifications of sex, sex is fruitful. Now remember, the unbelieving world wants, has declared war on fruit. They, they don't want the complication of fruit. That, that's what it is, is the complication. So, this is the necessary ramification of sex. The civil order will have to add, add its amen or not 
to that definition of marriage, whatever it is. And for those who want the state to add its amen to any voluntary definition of marriage, no limits whatever, then I have to confess that I've never heard anything scarier or dumber in my life, and I think we're headed there. And I don't think we should underestimate the ability of large sectors of the church to go along with it as long as there's a full court press from the media and us getting hard glances from the kids at the cool table over our opposition to whatever it is. If this view were to be established, then bid farewell to the nation. If this, the, the current revolution that's going on with regard to Obergefell, homosexual marriage, uh, uh, tranny rights, all of, all of this, and what's coming, we're, we're headed into transhumanism, and then we're headed into uh, sex with robots and all of that. So I wrote this book about that. Right, Sally, right? And I set the book like 30 years in the future, 20 or 30 years, anyway, generation or so in the future, talking about the logic of what I saw developing. And then probably within six months, I started getting people emailing me clips of this guy in Europe who married his sex bot. And okay, it took, I thought I was setting it safely down the, my dystopia safely down the road. And it's starting to happen in real time. If these things are established, now it's, it's certainly the case that they've been instantiated in the law, they've been recognized, but it's also the case that there's still a hot dispute over all of it, that there's still a dispute. You all are here. You are here now. I can, I've been in these trenches and I've been in this war for a long time, and I can pretty much guarantee you that if we had this conference with this topic on these subjects 30 years ago, we'd have had 20 people show up. This was not, I think, I think the unbelievers have gotten your attention, have they not? So, if these things that are, that are being pushed down our throats, if the, there's radical redefinition of marriage, anybody can be married to anything or anyone, and what's to prevent if, if, you, uh, if you have your tubes tied or if, you, if there's a vasectomy, what's to prevent a brother and a sister from marrying? Um, love is love, man. Well, the point is, I used the image earlier of free fall. We're in free fall. It's not a slippery slope. It's free fall. And there are rocks down below. And we are going, we're headed for this catastrophe. And it's either going to be a deliverance straight out of the Old Testament, all right, it's going to be one of those things where, how did God do that? We're going to be delivered or we're not going to be delivered. So if this view that we're contesting, if these things that we're contesting are not successfully challenged, then bid farewell to this nation, bid farewell to this republic. I will go down to see her like the fellow did in St. James Infirmary, so cold, so sweet, so sweet, so fair. So what should the response be? What should we do? The need of the hour, the need of the hour is for God to raise up a masculine ministry. A masculine ministry, remembering everything that I said about the femininity of the church in the previous section. We do not confuse testosterone with the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, we are looking for testosterone. God made it. It was not the result of the fall. Some amounts of it are the result of the fall. <laughs> but God made it. It's a glory. It's a good thing. You want your boys to be boys. You want your boys to learn how to be men. And you, in order, I remember years ago doing a teacher training thing at Logos, and I was talking about reminding the teachers that all the little girls in your class, elementary school, are going to be future moms and nurses, and they're going to be doing all these things. And everybody sat there, and they said, and the boys in your class are going to be airline pilots and naval officers and lawyers, and all the teachers got this panic look on these boys? <laughs> Not only so, but those little boys, those, those boys, some of them, it, this is one of the things that just gives me joy. 
Uh, some of the boys that grew up that were a handful and they were squirreling around and they're doing that, they're now on the school board. Puzzling what we're going to do about all the little boys. <laughs> what are we going to do about the boys? You want the boys to be boys. You want the boys to be disciplined boys. You want the boys to learn what it means to work hard. You want them to learn obedience, right? But you want them to learn obedience like a boy. That boys and girls are different. Entirely, completely different. And, moms, your husband has a better idea of what's going on in that little head than you do. Because he remembers trying that trick himself. Oh, I just had a really good talk with him the other night. You know, did you? <laughs> I think he really opened up for that. <laughs> Don't be a chump. <laughs> By the same token, men, your wife has a whole lot better idea what's going on in your girl's head than you do. And by a certain age, you know that you have no idea what's going on. But I digress. We do not confuse testosterone with the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, we are looking for testosterone. The ministry of the word should be, as the Puritans most certainly were, highly sexed. Highly sexed. If a man feels called to the ministry, one of the first things he should do is find a sweet little thing with a stout heart, marry her, and start having fat evangelical babies. Preach it. <laughs> This is something the homo-catechized world will sneer at, but only because they can't do it. Do you see that? They can't do it. They want test tube babies. They want to grow them in a lab somewhere. They want to adopt them. They want to, in a parasitic way, adopt and, and lay claim on our children. And, they, and, and their name for us, is, their contemptuous name for us, is breeders. We are breeders. In times like ours, it's a standing disgrace that courage is not required to preach sermons. Courage is... It, it, look at what's going on in the world. Look at, look at what's happening in our nation. We should be thoroughly embarrassed by the fact that we have thousands of pulpits across the land and the secularists who are wrecking our nation are not in the slightest bit afraid of what we are saying in them. How did that happen? How did that happen? I think that happened because of a radical uh, dualism that we've adopted, where we have divided things into sacred and, uh, uh, secular and sacred, and we have said that Jesus, Jesus is Lord over the sacred stuff. He's the king of heaven and the king of my heart. And then we think that the devil and the spirit of the age and all this that runs, runs the stuff out in the world. No. No. And this leads, naturally enough, to the last point and what I would call a call for action. Why do we shy away from fruitfulness? We want ministers with fruitful families, fruitful families. We want churches that are fruitful. We want churches that glorify fruitfulness. We want companies that glorify hard work and fruitfulness. We want, we, we want to see the, the Lord bless the work of our hands. May the beauty of the Lord rest upon it, as, as the 90th Psalm concludes. Why do, we shy, why do we shy away from this? The answer is that in the providence of God, fruitfulness is not something we discover on the big rock Candy Mountain. Fr fruitfulness is glorious, but fruitfulness is gloriously hard. Fruitfulness is glorious, but fruitfulness is gloriously hard. As my son put it one time talking to his mother, he said, Mom, baskets of fruit are heavy. Baskets of fruit are heavy. Do you want to you carry that back to the barn? Do you want to carry that back to the house? It's heavy. You're going to sweat. It's, going, it's hard work. Right? It's back-breaking work. Fruitfulness is difficult. Hebrews 12, 
Verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. No discipline seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Discipline is difficult, but there's a glorious harvest. Discipline is hard. The discipline of cultivating fruitfulness is hard. There's an old saying, I think it's a southern slang saying, that uh, a hot sun and a slow mule has been responsible for many a call to the ministry. I hear the voice of God saying, get out of the, you know, you need to get out of here. I want an indoor job with no heavy, heavy lifting. But that's not the, that's not it. What we want to communicate, what should be communicated, is the ministry, the ministry of the word and sacrament should be one of the most perilous places on the planet. It should be. And we should want men who are attracted to that because of the difficulty, because of the challenge, and because of the honor of the one whose honor is being impugned by our unbelieving generation. It's difficult. It's hard. And that's why people don't want to do it. They want a convenient, they, they want a reformation. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a reformation? But they want a convenience store reformation. We want to get our reformation the same way we want our coffee at the convenience store. We want it hot and we want it now. But it doesn't happen that way. No, no discipline seems joyful in the present, but there's a long slog. There's a long period of preparation. You've got to prepare the soil. You've got to plow. You've got to plant. You've got to wait. You've got to trust. You've got to get up early. You've got to go to bed late. And you've got to realize that none of this is going to do any good unless the Lord is going to build the house. He labors in vain who builds the house if the Lord is not building the house. When Christ calls a man, Bonhoeffer said, he bids him come and die. Take up your cross, Jesus said, and come follow me. Take up your cross and come follow me. The old blues song says that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. The key to fruitfulness is sacrifice. The key to fruitfulness is sacrifice. The key to the great harvest of reformation is willingness to die. Willingness to have your reputation die, willingness to actually die, willingness to have everything you have taken away, to suffer as the Hebrew Christians suffered the confiscation of their property, to not be spitting mad over infringements to your personal convenience. The issue, that's not the issue. The issue is they're claiming to be God. The issue is not me being irritated by what they asked me to do. But the issue is who is Lord? Is Caesar Lord or is Jesus Lord? That's the issue. The key to the great harvest of Reformation is a willingness to risk everything. Do you realize that every, you, you probably have um, in your town unbelieving universities and colleges. You have unbelieving institutions, parachurch organizations that used to be faithful and now are not. You could probably look up a directory of a number of mainline churches that used to be faithful and orthodox and now they're apologizing to plants or whatever it is that they're, they're doing. They're ordaining this and that and rainbow flags are hanging out in front of their place and they're doing all of these things. But you have to understand that every one of those institutions had a meeting at some point where the elders or the board of trustees or whoever was responsible for making those decisions decided that it would be better to survive faithless than to go down faithful. That was the decision. That was what was on the agenda. Are we going to be guilty of the folly of martyrdom? Are we going to go out of existence? Or are we going to keep the name and the brand and the reputation, but then drift into unbelief? 
drift into the current insanity. All the Ivy League schools were founded as Christian institutions to train the ministry, to train ministers. There was, at some point, they decided that survival was more important than faithfulness. And we have to resolve before God that we would rather die than deny the Lord. We would rather die than deny the Lord. That's what it comes down to because that's the only pressure point they have. They want to kill your reputation or your livelihood or your, your life. They want, to, they want to take you out. And they want to threaten to take you out and they will threaten to take you out. And you know what you need to do? You have to not care. Before the Lord, not care. Under the Lord, you, you know, when you, you see martyrs in Scripture, you see when Peter was in prison in the book of Acts, you saw that the, the saints were gathered at John Mark's house praying for him. It's not like we're Stoics. We're not Stoics. I don't mean we don't care in that way. I mean we don't care before God. We don't care in the presence of God. We don't care coram Deo. Are they going to lie about you? They most certainly will. And your response is to what? Not care. Your response is to not care. Jesus said, when people insult you, and they slander you, and they say they despitefully use you, they say all manner of wicked things about you, what does Jesus say to do? What are our instructions? Right? Some of you uh, may have had the, the awkward, abrupt experience of being lied about in the newspaper, or lied about on a news report. Your, your school you started is being lied about, or the church you planted is being lied about, or your minister is being lied about. And you think, oh, well, the devil's a liar. He's the father of liars. That's the, his central weapon. That's what he has. And what does Jesus tell us to do? What does Jesus say to do? When you're lied about, when they slander you, when they tell you all sorts of things, he says, I'm going to put a few extra things, but not the essential thing. He says, I want you to take all the lies on board. I want you to walk around the corner, get out of sight, and I want you to dance a little jig. I want you, I want you doing a little touchdown dance around the corner. He says, in that day, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. In that day, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Why? Because we want to be approved by God. We don't want to be approved by man. They are not going to give you the approval you want unless you sell the farm, unless you give it away. So what you want to do is stand faithful. You want to be right out of, Pilgr right out of Bunyan. You want to be Mr. Standfast. You want to stand fast, hold the line. And this is the, this is the way it works. The key to the great harvest of Reformation is a willingness to die, Jesus says this in John 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That's where the church needs to be. The church is not, the church is not bearing fruit the way it ought to bear fruit in this day that desperately needs fruit because the church wants reformation without going in the ground. We need to go in the ground. We need to give it all up, surrender the whole thing, and say, God, this is yours. Blow it up if you want. My life is yours. My business is yours. Our church is yours. It all belongs to you. You know, I've, I've had moments, I bet you have, when I'm trying to husband my resources and and I'm doing a good job, and I'm you know, going along, and I'm feeling pretty happy about it, and then some part of the car blows up. And, and I sometimes you know, look toward heaven or something like this and say, Lord, I think you have a much more cavalier view of your resources than I do. <laughs> I, I did not need $600 of transmission work. That was not on my schedule but it was on his, right? It was on his. It's on his schedule. Everything. Lay it out. Present your bodies in, in Romans 12. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Sacrifices, altars, the car you drive in is an altar. 
The bed you sleep in is an altar. The chair you're sitting in is an altar. The floor you're standing on is an altar. Present your body as a living sacrifice. When the ascension offering or the whole burnt offering, as many of your translations have it, is consumed in the fire, it goes up to God in a column of smoke. That should be your life. You want to go up to God in a column of smoke. You want your worship to go up to God in a column of smoke. You want your love for your wife and your respect for your husband and your time with your kids to be a fragrant offering going up to God in a column of smoke, and that means you die. That means you die. And when you die to the world and die to all the things, all the bubbles that they're going to offer you, when you die, what does Jesus say? But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Did you hear that? Much fruit. What do we want? What do we need? What must we have in this fruitless generation? We must have Christians who are willing to die. Die in their families. Die in their churches. Die in the workplace. We must have Christians who are willing to lay it all out, trusting in the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father in God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for your word. I pray that as we think about these things, as we ponder them, that your Holy Spirit would accompany everyone here. Make sure that we make the right applications, not the wrong ones. Father, there are many ways we could go wrong in uh, uh, applying these truths in the wrong area, the wrong way, or upside down. Father, please protect us from that folly, but also protect us from the folly of shrinking back and not doing what your word plainly calls us to do. We commit it all to you in the name of Jesus, and amen. It is the duty of the free man to resist tyranny at every turn. Every man will either watch his freedom stripped away or take action to protect what he loves. Introducing the A3, the newest revolutionary body armor from Armored Republic. The A3 is the new standard for lightweight multi-hit body armor. A3 plates are incredibly light at 4.6 pounds. The patented design captures fragmentation while remaining multi-hit capable. The A3 will stop up to M80 ball, yet comes in at only 0.7 inches thick. The A3 is the thinnest NIJ.06 compliant or certified composite standalone plate that includes the drop test. The A3 is the first of its kind, patent pending, that combines an alloy strike face with polyethylene backing, revolutionizing body armor technology by providing strength and durability while remaining sleek and maneuverable. The A3 is the new standard in lightweight body armor. The fight against tyranny just got stronger.